Hiya. Thanks. Thank you for having me. Mm. <laughs> this is so smart. Um, so it's an incredible honor to have you here today for, I mean, your bio, the incredible list of reasons that are put in your bio, um, and I'm a massive fan of your podcast more generally. Oh, thank um, you. So it's really thankful that you've made the journey up to Cambridge to see us. No, it's so nice to be here, and nice to get out of London for an afternoon. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm going to start off with some moderated Q&A, um, and we're going to touch on different things like your modelling and girls talk, your activism more generally, and then I'll open up the floor for uh, questions and answers from the audience. Um, so to start off with, I always try to begin at the beginning with, with people sort of when their careers um, began. Mm. Um, so both of your parents were involved in the fashion agency as location scouts and photography agents, uh, respectively. Um, and you began modeling more formally after school and university. Um, so how do you think that your beginnings in modeling and the mental health issues that you suffered during that period impacted your career and the work you're driven to do today? Good question. Okay, so um, I think when I first started modeling, it, when I, I wasn't doing it properly, my parents had a, like a very kind of strict outlook on kind of making sure that we put education first and so it wasn't like I was like missing school for like modeling jobs it was always like school had to come first but I think at the beginning it wasn't until like afterwards I, I, I had to really like kind of look back on my place within the industry and how kind of why I didn't have any confidence kind of going into it. I just had this idea that I wanted a really kind of independent life and I wanted to have independence financially from my mum and dad. Um, but actually looking at the industry at that time when I was about 16, 17, there was no one within the industry that, that I could um, relate to, who I could like reference myself off of. Um, there was no one who looked even nearly like me but but I think that within the industry there was this kind of I think I don't know it's quite hard to explain there was this sort of embarrassment I think I felt about the the rejection that I faced during that period before my kind of career took off this embarrassment that I I couldn't I didn't want anyone to see how much the rejection affected me so instead of really being quite honest about it, I just kind of forgot about it. And then, I mean, it didn't... It, it, I just found it really hard to kind of navigate through it because I had um, so little confidence in myself and I had no idea who I was. So someone asking me to come and be myself and be confident was like the biggest ask in the world. But afterwards, I really kind of took some time away and so when I came back to modeling and my kind of career took off I really um, I went in it I went into it with a I just had self-worth I had I had worked so hard on myself I'd been in such a dark place that rejection like that was like a kind of it was nothing in comparison to what I'd been through. Mm -hmm. So, and my whole outlook on it was that when I go into it, if they don't want me, it's their loss. I had to kind of keep it like that. I had to keep it quite black and white so as to protect myself. Um, but I also sat in those like moments of rejection and, and instead of pushing it away, really kind of looked at why it affected me, why mm -hmm. I felt like this... Um, this outsider, why I didn't feel like I was welcome in the industry, um, even though I'd been like brought up around it and knew so many people mm. within it. Um, yeah. Yeah. And I mean, it doesn't sound like there is this contrast, and I know you've spoken about, you spoke about it in your Guardian article, but, but do you think that there is a tension there between like focusing on mental health and, and being involved in the fashion industry? Um, both as like a consumer of, of, of any modeling that, that you do and as like you yourself. Do you think, what's, wait, word that again, so do you think... That there's a tension there between sort of your focus on mental health and your work on it and also being involved in the fashion industry. Do I think they work together? Yeah. 
No, not at all. <laughs> no, they definitely don't. Um, and I think that's something that I have to work on on a daily basis. They definitely don't work together. And I think that my mental health is something I work on on a daily basis and is largely affected because I am constantly being judged on the way I look. Mm. Um, and I have to be really strong and really kind of self-assured so that I don't let certain people affect me. I don't let their energy affect me and bring that into my like kind of everyday life. But having something like Girls Talk, having um, lots of other things that I do in my life has been kind of monumental in, in kind of kind of looking after myself but I just think it you know there have been some major changes and I'm really lucky that I kind of get to be quite picky I, I choose to work with really amazing people who see me as more than just this um, and who really kind of respect that I'm a human and jo not just someone that they can move around and clothe and do mm -hmm. what they want with um, but the thing is, is that on set, you can't, you know, no one really has time for you to bring your outside mm -hmm. life onto set. You're there to kind of do a job. So it, it, you know, when it gets too much, it's usually modeling that I have to put down because it's, I have to, you know, you're constantly around people. I find it quite hard and you're constantly giving people energy. Um, which usually is quite detrimental to any energy that you want to give to your friends, your family, mm. boyfriend, girlfriend, whatever. Mm. And I mean, we spoke about this um, just before you came in. It's about like the emotional energy use that I think is so tied in with your work both in Girls Talk and in modeling. Um, this is a question that I, I try to ask a lot of people who come here is what's kind of like the number one self-care tip that you have in, in approaching that kind, of, that kind of issue? Yeah, exercise for me. It's so boring and it's so like kind <laughs> of typical and like such a like a chore. But for me, I hit a... Um, kind of moment in my life where exercise really stopped being about you know how great I can make my ass and how great I can make my arms and all those kind of things It really moved into this realm of being I have to do this because mm -hmm. it will make or break my day and if I do do it um, the way I look at situations is I can just tolerate more I can look at things with a more positive outlook mm. um, so exercise is really key for me. And then I also do, like I was kind of talking to a friend yesterday who's never, and they're a lot older than me, but they've never spent any time by themselves. And they're really kind of looking at that and about to kind of go on a trip by themselves. And I spend a lot of time, I try and make, um, have moments in the year where I'm just on my own, whether mm -hmm. that means like traveling by myself or going somewhere by myself. But it, it just gives me that time to really kind of concentrate on and look at what I really need to look at and also kind of look at like the accomplishments that I've made or things that I've I've come through and and yeah but I just need the silence to do that yeah I mean that's super interesting because like I think time by myself is definitely something that I I value a lot mm. I think in Cambridge is actually quite difficult to get so definitely something I think everyone like even students when you mm. kind of feel like you have to be seeing friends or yeah, working yeah. or at lectures something that people definitely need to focus on um, moving back to, to, to talking about your modelling career um, you've spoken about uh, racism and colorism in the past and I think this is something that's definitely quite pertinent to the remark that you made earlier about the modeling industry and not mm. being able to find someone who kind of you could sympathize with is um, how do you sort of interpret your space in in the modeling industry as a mixed race woman um, I find it quite complicated you know I there are lots of people that I've had the chance to work with that are really making moves in the right direction of making it and more inclusive space to work within, to even look at. But, I mean, you just have to look at the kind of, the recent um, German L article that was like, black is back, and that, to me, I look at that and I'm like, oh, I feel as if we've never, we haven't moved at all. Mm. I'm like, how can something like that be 
in a magazine. Um, and it really makes you, me, look at my kind of position in, within the industry and kind of like question um, the people that I work with mm. and question the way that they look at me and in, in comparison to other girls that I'm working with. But, um, yeah, I think it's... But, you know, again, and I've spoken about this before, you know, there's a quota. I, I have a lot more... You know, my story would be a lot more different to um, a dude's, you know who is not mixed, uh, you know, we have a completely different story as well. The, the kind of, the quota that is one that, you know, I hope one day we don't have works in my benefit. I have a job because there are some, in some countries, they have to have a mixed race girl, they have to have an Asian girl, they have to have mm. um, a blonde, a brunette. So in that sense, you know, the reason I get to do and have had the career that I have is because of this quota but does it make you feel comfortable does it make you feel welcome may, probably not mm. um, but you know I just even if I look at kind of you know hair and the kind of and now they do have kind of more like black hair dresses and 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 black makeup artists or people who have an understanding of what it means to kind of um, look at different skin tones and, mm. and, and work with different hair textures. That has definitely changed. But it's still, you know, it, for a model, I think I always found sitting in that chair, I was incredibly uncomfortable because I felt that I was, it was, more, it, I was a burden because it wasn't easy. Mm. Um, I don't know if I'm explaining myself right. But it is definitely, you know, there are lots of people who are, are making it their number one priority and who really do care. But what I find quite difficult these days is I get even confused. I get confused by, is it just a trend? Is it, you know, are people just jumping on board of this because we're talking about it and because people are shouting about it? Or is it something that really... Uh, or, uh, you know, do people actually really give a shit about wanting to, to make it a priority? Do they see the importance mm -hmm. to it for a young girl, a young man looking through a magazine and being able to see someone that looks like themselves? Mm. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, it's definitely such a sort of nuanced topic. Mm. And I'm, I'm glad that you've kind of express that through your answer because I mean you can talk about colorism you can talk about racism and 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 in terms of how you make the sort of invitation into these spaces a genuine invitation as opposed to something that that is based on you know self-interest or, or yeah thought so I don't know a feeling like you're part of a quota makes you feel like you're welcome yeah I mean being one of three black girls in a catwalk show okay yes we've we're lucky we got the opportunity but does it make me feel like I actually, you know, am I there because there would be so much backlash if I wasn't? Mm, yeah. I don't know. Yeah. But we'll have to see, you know, with the years to come and see if this sticks and people really kind of start taking it seriously. Yeah. I mean, in general, would you say that you're supportive of quotas as a sort of positive discrimination effort, or do you think as an overall that most of the time they can seem quite patronizing or like if you had to make a ruling on, on, on the use of them? I think it, it, it changes. I'm, I'm always, I get surprised all the time by like different people that I get the chance to work with who I think are definitely not on the kind of same flex as me but who show face to be very m much like-minded and who mm. really kind of um, celebrate everything that I'm about and everything I stand for and there are moments where I'm like, it seems like you don't care at all, you know, mm. I, d I don't know, it's from person to person really. Mm. Um, yeah. Yeah, that's super interesting, yeah. I think definitely, I think yeah, I'm just taking in your answer about this person-to-person -person thing. I think it probably is like definitely an attitude thing as mm. well, um, and the way that people speak to you. Um, 
kind of moving with my last question kind of on modeling is um, you mentioned hair earlier and, and you mentioned hair anxiety. And I mean, you've spoken in the past about how you made the decision to shave your hair off despite sort of objections from, from mm. your agency is, I guess my question is, what do you think was the sort of overriding motivation there that, that made you sort of do it despite what your agency was saying? And do you have any regrets about it? No, definitely not. It makes my mornings really easy and <laughs> uncomplicated. Um, I, I did it because, I mean, I've had to kind of look at it. I don't know if I really, if you would have asked me back then if I could have really articulated it like this, but because I think I was in such a different place in my life where I was looking for any... Um, way to make myself feel better about being myself mm. so um i think i just was exhausted i was exhausted it was like that what i was explaining about sitting in a makeup chair and feeling and looking at these like five people around me like panicking over the thickness of my hair i couldn't bear mm. to have that anymore i couldn't bear the idea that i was always constantly kind of fretting and and anxious about you know um how flat it was and how it lay and how mm. neat it was and how it fell and if it you know i and i just couldn't it to me it was just like a it was something that i needed to do to like kind of move in the right direction of being a lot more comfortable in my mm. skin and that felt like a kind of a big move and something that I didn't have to worry about anymore mm. um, and it was also something that I could look at as being the first probably one of the first um, moves I made in actually doing something for myself and not just doing it because I felt that it was um, would make it easier for me to fit in yeah and I think it was school I had so much like hair angst from school mm. um, just from like constant like teasing and all sorts of things that really kind of just stuck with me and I didn't really realize because it felt in the big grand scheme of things like quite kind of smallish things no one spoke about black hair no one spoke about the anxiety surrounding it mm. um, so to me it was just like oh you know let's not complain um, and so it wasn't like until later in life that I was like kind of really looked at it and also met amazing women who were also had the same anxieties as me and who had been through similar, similar situations. Yeah. But I see it with my sister. My sister's hair is still kind of like, she's got massive hair and she, um, you know, every now and then she'll get lucky and we've got this, um, this amazing like hairdresser who's sometimes on shoots um who's a black woman she knows you know she can blow dry thick hair in two seconds and then sometimes you've got like five people looking at you and wondering what the hell they're mm -hmm. going to do yeah. and i don't think they realize how that makes you feel it just again goes back into feeling like you're an imposter yeah. and that you're not welcome and that no one um and that it's not e yeah i don't know yeah, I mean, it, you're right, it definitely ties into this issue of like, when if you're going to invite someone to a space, making sure that, mm. that the provisions are made and that they feel welcome. You would think that one would be educated in how to do all different types of skin yeah. tone, but still I can be on, on in, you know, during show season and I'll move from makeup artist to makeup artist because they can't get my skin complexion right and I mean mine's not I mean I'm really pale at the moment but like <laughs> it, it it's not that complicated yeah yeah it's just strange because yeah. you think that that would be like a basic you know I'm grey or suddenly I'm like orange it's like <laughs> no, no, <laughs> thanks <laughs> um moving on to girls talk um obviously girls talk is is a massive part of, of your life and your career now um I think to start off with is why did you found Girls Talk and um, can we talk a bit about the point that you're at in your life when you decide to go ahead with it and, and make this a thing? Like yeah, so I think I was telling the girls before upstairs, I think after like it was during like 2014 I just had like the worst year, it was just awful and I think and my parents had given me, I was uh, like a period of time they given me in a couple of months so they were going to financially support me and they had given me like the kind of space and freedom to 
to not have to worry about modeling, not have to worry about kind of showing up for a mm. particular job or, a, you know, working in a shop like I did or nannying or whatever it was. And that I had really had the space to kind of really concentrate on trying to stay sober and, and looking after like my mental health. So I, really, I couldn't do that in London. So I decided I'd like, I was going to go um, to America for a bit. And during that time, I kind of, it gave me the space to really start, um, I started working at different kind of schools and different kind of like organizations, mm -hmm. um, which in turn gave me a, a moment to stop thinking about myself and really kind of put a lot of energy into mm. other issues that were going on around me, not necessarily around me, but were happening. Um, and I realized how happy it made me. And, um, and it was such a massive realization to have been on this path that I thought I was supposed to be on and then to have gone through such a dark time and realized that it was the completely wrong path and I was just kind of following what everyone else was doing or mm -hmm. doing what I thought my parents wanted me to do, um, et cetera. And it was like, um, and during that time, I, I kind of, I was obviously in the rooms of NA and AA and I kind of, had been told constantly to share and be honest and open in, but I had always been told in very kind of confidential spaces. And every time I shared, other women or men would put their hands up and they would share back and they would um, share about situations they'd been in. And I was like, wow, this is mind blowing that mm. I've been given this space through this dark time and here I'm really, able to be completely myself and no one judges me and there's no stigma and it doesn't matter that I did that fucked up thing because actually so and so and so and so did it as well. Um, and so I watched as I was kind of working in the schools and working for these different charities and then also going to the rooms and I, I, I it kind of struck me that I, I couldn't understand why I'd had to get, I'd had to have got to such a dark point in my life to have ever been given a space where I was mm. allowed to kind of speak freely and openly and really um, be educated on mental health and all sorts of things. And so I decided that I wanted to do something about it. Um, I really had to look at um, my time in school and where the kind of where it had changed and what had made me so unhappy mm -hmm. and I could really see um, that had happened, it had happened when I was at school and so I kind of just put them all together and realized that a space was very much needed where we were able to talk about everything that was going on in our lives mm -hmm. and it was a space that I really needed um, mm -hmm. and the kind of community that I built and that they built mm -hmm. Um, has very much kind of it looks after me as much as I hope it looks after them yeah. um, I'm really able it's, it, there is never a moment and I think that's the thing with, you know, with all the different parts of my life there are moments in my fashion life where I, I just don't want to be there there is never a moment in the girls talk kind of realm where I ever I never I always want to be there I always it doesn't matter how you know what my mood is at that time, I feel so incredibly welcome. Mm. Um, and it also always has such kind of positive outcomes for me and how I kind of navigate through my own life after that. And I learn mm. so much. Um, but I think it was also, you know, everyone around me was like, oh, well, are you sure this is a good idea? Are you sure you can start this? I think my parents, of course, were like highly kind of anxious about my life and just nervous about me in general mm -hmm. um, but I just I think it was just a ch probably my first challenge the first mm -hmm. time that I'd I hadn't stopped myself because I was like scared of rejection or failure I just started it yeah I mean it's incredible because you've created such a sort of open and welcoming space and I mean I speak for everyone I say that the community has really I think developed into into an amazing sort of atmosphere and, and a place where girls can talk and feel feel welcome about talking about things that are personal to them and um, 
I mean, it's interesting because one thing that I found very special about Girls Talk was that I think increasingly there's this atmosphere where people will be like, oh, you, you're not allowed to sympathize with that, like you can't speak about that, and it can be divisive. And I think there's mileage in some of these claims, definitely. Um, but, but it does feel quite like identitarian sometimes. And I think one of my sort of big questions to you is like, how do you manage to create a space where everyone feels welcome and like they can mm. contribute and, and, and talk about everything? Yeah, I think, yeah, I had to look at that. I was, I, because I go to other people's events and no shade on them. I think well, that lots of people are doing great things, but there, there's something that I think is like different about Girls Talk. I wouldn't, you know, mm. I'm proud of what we do as a team. Mm. Um, I think for me it had to come, you know, I'm a posh mixed race guy, I went to private school there, I, and I think I had to look at that, I had to look at also kind of my differences between some of my like friends that are also posh and went to private school but mm. white, mm. and I think I just had to look at all the kind of different parts of me um, and I wanted to create somewhere where I would still feel welcome and be able to kind of be educated on different people's circumstances. Mm. I also, um, I also think I knew that whenever I'm like, it, it could be on the podcast, it could be at a girls talk event, I always give part of myself. I always share something that's going on in my life. And I don't think you see that all the time because mm. I think we're, we're at a time sometimes where we're quite, we're in this time of like cancel culture where people get quite scared of kind of giving their opinion on things and mm. um, sharing about what's going on in their life. And I knew that although I might not be able to relate to you, maybe I haven't been through that. I do understand like human emotion. I understand sadness. I understand happiness. Mm. I understand anger. And I try and go into any girls talk situation with just an understanding of mm. human emotion. Mm. Um, I, I, you know, even with the school tour, um, they were all state schools. There were so many things I didn't understand, but mm. I didn't meet that with anxiety and let me try and fix you and let me try and solve this. Mm. Let me just try and listen um, and I'll give you parts of me and maybe that will make you feel more comfortable in order to share what's going on in your life but why would anyone feel comfortable enough to stand up in front of a group of girls and share what's going on in their life if they don't see it on stage with the panelists that my team and I kind of carefully pick who are people who are open and understanding and not judgmental so I try my hardest to always kind of follow those kind of traditions that we speak so highly of in in, mm. in girls talk yeah. um, but it's also small things like you know all our events are free you know all our events you're given a meal um, that in itself you know I'm lucky enough that I can kind of sometimes use my modeling kind of stuff to work alongside girls talk so I mm. can do events that are free but mm. that in itself will cut out you know no one will have to think that um, whether you, you know, five pounds is a lot to you or not yeah. a lot to you. You don't even have to make that decision. The doors are open. Mm. Yeah, definitely. And I think it's, I mean, hearing you talk about sort of emotion and understanding is so illuminating because I think, like you're saying, we do live in this age of cancel culture and we do, I mean, interactions that you have with people can come off as like, not you personally, but as in like interactions that you have amongst groups of people of different backgrounds. There's so much sort of scope for things to come off as patronizing. Um, and I don't buy into this whole thing where people are like, oh, you know, like university students are snowflakes at all. But I think it's just so refreshing to hear someone speak about it in such a sort of normal and 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 well, it is uncomfortable way. you know yeah. there are moments on my podcast where i'm like do i i'm so nervous about talking about gender what if i say the wrong thing mm. what if i you know use the wrong pronoun what if i you know when i'm talking about grief i my parents are still here what if i say something insensitive mm. just forget about all of that like it it leads to only um a boring conversation where <laughs> that person feels like you are an awkward conversation that leads to no emotion or any understanding yeah. or any kind of 
openness and freeness to talk about what is actually going on in your life. Yeah. Um, and I think that's the thing. It's, it's, everything is quite uncomfortable. But I just choose personally to just kind of put that aside. Yeah, and I mean, in an age that's so dominated by, like, yeah. stock phrases, and I see it all the time when I interview people and they're not open and they're, they're, they're nervous about touching mm. certain categories yeah. and they won't bring it up or they'll ask me specifically, don't ask any questions about this. Um, and it's just kind of like, but you could address it. Mm. Um, okay, so I'm going to open up the floor to questions soon, but I'm going to round off with my last two questions. So one of them is um, talking about your girls' talk events, and you've done them, as I said in your introduction, places like Ghana and Poland. Um, so I'd be interested just to hear about sort of like the process when you plan these events. So how do you pick the locations? I know that Ghana was obviously quite personal to you, um, and and you've talked about picking panelists, but what what do you think makes them so important and 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 inspiring? They're changing all the time, like Ghana, for instance. I definitely played such a kind of, usually I'm not, I mean, sometimes sometimes on, I'm on most panels or I, like, introduce most panels. And Ghana was really, was such a monumental moment for us um, and for me personally because I, I really got the chance to sit back and watch. Um, and I didn't take part in every single panel. And it really showed me that... I know for a fact that girls talk is like what we speak about is needed all over the world, but that doesn't mean that I'm needed all mm. over the world. And there are so many things I don't understand. Mm. And actually, we have the power to bring girls talk to different places and use the people who are already there doing amazing things and give mm. them the platform to educate mm. and share what's going on in their lives. So that was like a mega moment for for girls talk but in terms of we're a really small team and like Poland was a kind of a get you know it was it actually started off as a kind of modeling thing and then my team and I decided that you know we weren't really that interested in doing it if it wasn't we weren't able to do something bigger there especially with the kind of um, abortion issues yeah. going on there um, and that was a mega moment for us again because we went um, not kind of knowing how it was probably the first time that we hadn't done some, some like an event in like the UK or America so we weren't really we didn't really know how the kind of girls were going to act and how they were going to take to the kind of conversation and mm -hmm. everything like that there was also the like language barrier mm -hmm. and, also, and I mean the panel went on for like two hours mm. I mean the girls had so much that they wanted to talk about mm. and actually it marked a really big change because it stopped being about what was going on in stage yes that was important in terms of like moving the conversation in a great direction mm. but what happened is is all these girls started standing up and not asking questions and actually just sharing about what was going on in their lives mm. and that kind of changed it all for us and we really started basing our kind of um, formatting our events around this idea that we wanted to make it so that even if you don't have a question maybe you want to just share about what's going on in your life mm. and it kind of yeah so it's kind of been like working like that really yeah and it's so incredible that it translates so clearly across cultural context mm, and the basic smart. message of girl talk. Well, that's what I always I remember. Like I'd so I was the schools I was working with for in LA were in, on Skid Row, and um, I remember coming back to London Christmas and I was sat next to this like I think he was like a teacher. He was like a maths teacher, and his 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 girlfriend turned to me. And she was like, "Yeah, but how are you going to be able to talk to you know kids from state schools? How are you going to?" be able to talk to like because um, you know you're like posh and from you went to private school and I was like there is the issue if you if you're already looking at it like that then we've already lost the battle you've already mm. kind of made it so that we all have to kind of mm. keep to ourselves and keep to what we know but actually there were loads of things I learned so much you know teaching in the schools on mm. Skid Row there were lots mm. of things I didn't understand and and I'm lucky to have never gone through mm. there were lots of things I've never gone through when I was talking at Blair Gowrie High School in Scotland but there were lots of things that we both understood yeah and I mean with the Polish case especially thinking about like the abortion yeah. rights issues that have arisen there it's like I mean I've 
definitely never been through anything like that where I feel so like persecuted in that respect. But it, it's it's just so it's just so like illuminating that you can have that kind of event there and people are willing to speak up about it. Yeah, because it was it was you know we were talking about an abortion um, abortion rights in Poland and I had had to um, I had to have an abortion and it was it. Um, because I was open about it, even though actually it marked quite a, it it was of it was the one of the few things in my life that for some reason there's an energy around us that made me feel very kind of mm. um, ashamed about it. Mm. But that platform, that event, gave me also the space to talk about what I'd been through and mm. or to also to look at it in um, a new light and think how lucky I was that from, mm. you know, the time I found out to the time I walked out of hospital, I had always been given the chance to decide what I wanted to do. Mm. And that, again, goes back to what I was saying about human emotion. The, d the circumstances are different, but mm. I, th I think if we just put more work into it, we could always meet someone in the middle with just an understanding. Yeah. 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 Okay, I was going to ask a last question, but I do feel like people will want to ask their own questions. Mm. So I feel that I always ask every responsibility to, to open up. Um, so uh, please, if you would like to ask a question, raise your hand. Should we start with here? Yeah. Hi. <laughs> oh, sorry, do you mind waiting until the mic gets to you just because these are... Uh, it yeah, should, it, should, it should turn on. If it doesn't turn on, it should turn on itself, yeah. No, no, it's not. You know what? But I think just everyone can go, hear you. Yeah, anyway. just go. Yeah. Um, I found it really interesting what you said about the not necessarily being able to reconcile like, the fashion industry with what you do with girls talk because from the outside, I think that's something that so many girls look up to because I think there's such a tendency to put girls in boxes and especially at this university or like you're a law student you're a very certain type of person or whatever but being able to like listen to the people that you have on your podcast and listen to you obviously mm. being such a big role model in the fashion industry but also being so like intellectual and so in tune with the world around you and being able to talk about sex and female masturbation and female pleasure and things which just kind of seem at odds with each other so I guess I'm asking do you find it liberating kind of being part of both worlds or not because from the outside it looks liberating but it seems from the way you're talking about it it's kind of different yeah it's such a good um it is liberating because i think i remember doing i can't remember who it was who i maybe it was i can't remember who it was like maybe it was serena williams i think it was <laughs> serena williams and um she said i was like oh do you ever feel like kind of I can't remember how I word it. Do you feel ever like overwhelmed by like the pressures and stuff? And she was like, "It's a privilege." And actually, I really I look at both having both of those worlds in my life. I feel is like a, is a major privilege that I get mm. to move from both to both. Yes, it's hard because I feel like it pulls me and pushes me. I have to make kind of clear-cut decisions in order to protect the girls' talk because that forever will always be my major priority. But it is hard because it's like, okay, modelling pays the bills. I have all these responsibilities. I have girls' talk that needs to be funded, that is self-funded. You know, it's like, let me respect this thing that has given me such a great platform and actually has many positives. But it's hard because I think it's something... It's things like seeing that L Germany cover. It's like, I mean, um, the pages in L Germany. It's things like that that I feel that all my work with Girls Talk is moving in such an amazing, um, in such an amazing direction and really kind of every day is moving and learning and all the people that kind of make it are moving and learning. And I find that anything that I want to do in the fashion industry just moves at a much slower pace and I just find that really frustrating um, and it means that I have to be like kind of very rock steady in my opinions and my morals so that I don't get compromised and in turn compromise girls talk but it is liberating because I get to meet so many great people um, and I, I, I get to kind of wangle ways of kind of that benefit girls talk through kind of 
um, the modeling. But like, for instance, Nike was like the best, one of the, you know, one of the most amazing things that we did this year, but they really, um, it was the first time that they'd ever worked with something like Girls Talk. It was the first time they'd worked with um, a client where they split it, model, and everything that they're about and they put no red tape around us and really let us do exactly what we wanted but now they're learning because by doing that it's it's changed the w whole way that they work with other people it's also benefited them because you see what happens when you give the space to someone to really do things that are authentic and real and what that in turn creates but it's just like hard it's like you know it's like just you want to like wake people up but it is it's great do you have other questions you should go there hi hi Beatrice. Hi, Beatrice. Um, i just like to say um i think everything you're doing is amazing thank you um i just wanted to ask um do you ever uh, like regret going into the modeling industry because it sounds like it's put a lot of hardship um, into your life and your mental health and your mental state and everything, or do you feel that, that now you can use the strain that it puts in your mental health and use it to kind of stimulate um, and grow girls? Mm-hmm. Yeah. No, definitely don't regret it. Don't have any... Maybe one going to boarding school, maybe that's a regret. But, like, <laughs> other than that, no, no, absolutely no regrets. And it is... Um, is I always, you know, it would be so easy for me to sit here and, you know, when you ask me that question, to give you this spiel of how magical it is. And I just try and not do that. It mm. is, you know, the, I have to be, I want to be, like, real with all of you. And, and there are some days, you know, we were talking, I've had to, like, start this acne treatment because at age 27 I've decided, my skin has decided to give me acne. And Rahani, who I work with, was like, well, when did you start that? And I was like, oh, when I cancelled that job. It is, it's, 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 it's something that I'm still working around because it's, it taps into things that I'm still working on. Mm. You know, it taps into um, that sometimes I still feel uncomfortable in my skin, but... I have to assume to be this very confident person on that particular day because I have a job to do. But there are many times where I get to work with people who are so sensitive and who completely wholeheartedly celebrate who I am with all its flaws and its spots mm -hmm. and its whatever it is. So it changes. But yeah, never. I definitely don't regret it because it is... There are so many things I wouldn't have been able to do if I hadn't have that. I didn't have that support. Mm. Should we go to the back there? Yeah, yeah. Well, it's, it's, that's such a good question. Actually, at a lot of our events, we have, like, girls who really talk about the kind of the cultural differences and how it is to be brought up in, like, an African household. I was quite, you know, actually, every, on paper, it looks like my dad's the most, like, laid-back human in the world, but he's African to his cool, so he was <laughs> definitely, like, the more stricter um, parent but I think you know coming again it was like what I was saying to you again about our stories my you know even coming from a mixed race background I had um, two different sides to my life so they sometimes clashed and that made me feel uncomfortable my sister and I were only just talking about the other day it was like and I've said this a few times it's like I just for me it was like I didn't have the I mean, compared to, like, my cousins and stuff, I didn't have necessarily some of the kind of... Um, the rules that they had growing up, having two um, black parents, but or just African parents. Um, but for me, all the kind of... where I felt the most uncomfortable was actually, you know, then, because I was mixed race, I kind of... I just didn't ever feel like I was, like, black enough or white enough. So I kind of, you know, with half of my family, I always tried to fit in the other half. I always tried to fit in with them. And so, 
Yeah, I kind of, I'm not really answering your question. It's just, I didn't really have, um, there were certain things that my kind of, I actually felt that where emotion was concerned and where sexuality and talking about these things were concerned, it actually, the, the pushback came from my mum, who was English and quite uptight and had grown up in, um, with parents who didn't talk about anything emotional. Um, and actually, my dad was a lot more forthcoming to talking about emotion. And when he really realized that how it was affecting our family, he was actually amazing at kind of looking at it. But still with my, but you know, still with my like grandparents, I'm going back to kind of, there are things that, you know, I don't talk to my grandparents about or certain, they all know what I do, but they're, they just look at parts of it. It's a hard one, yeah. Mm. Should we, yeah, we have time for more questions. Yeah. So, uh, first of all, I'd just like to thank you because as someone who has been struggling with mental health for quite some time, I really admire all the efforts that you do with Girl Stop and how open you are with your own struggles. Uh, and my question is, you told at the beginning of the talk that at some point in your career you did a break, and when you came back to fashion, your mindset on how to deal with rejection changed. And what did you do during that time frame to mm. help you to make that change? So a lot of therapy. No, no. <laughs> uh, no, it was a lot of therapy. Um, <laughs> and um, uh, I think, I mean, obviously the therapy helped. I was on medication, which also helped in terms of just like being able to like get out of bed and brush my teeth and do normal basic human things. But it, it was just, I think... Having that, I had nothing to fall back on. I had to, you know, in order, I was told to kind of continue my journey of sobriety and like <coughs> happiness or whatever, that I had to start being honest. And so I really had to, I didn't really have any of my, my old habits to fall back on, which at a certain point were drugs and alcohol. I had none of that. So it really gave me, um, that period of time gave me, although it was like, highly uncomfortable and not necessarily very happy, probably as unhappy as I was when I was like before it all started. It gave me the space to really like sit. I just, t I, t I think everyone around me was always quite worried, you know, because I wouldn't like, you know, I was quite, I isolated myself. I, I wasn't very good about being, a, I wasn't good at being around people because I was just so uncomfortable the whole time. But what that time gave me was really a time to like just sit in anything that I was feeling. I really worked hard not to distract myself and and um, pretend like it wasn't happening. And I try and do that all the time, even though it's like uncomfortable and there are some times where I just want to like put on a mask and just like get it over and done with. I try and be quite like emotionally, what would be the word, like, just quite, kind of, I try and be just quite upfront about my, like, my mood and my emotion. Um, I also was quite strict about the energies around me. I think I went through a massive like mourning period of like realizing that there were just certain things I couldn't be around and there were certain things I couldn't do and there were certain people I just couldn't handle being around. Um, but in turn it like led me to meeting like great people who really, um, who really supported me and, and, and didn't kind of brush aside like my mental health and the fact that I needed to to be sober and all these sort of things that were coming into my life um, but it was a hard one it was such a di it was like you think 
actually, I think, I was talking to a friend of mine who, like, majorly needs to get sober, and I was like, it's probably not going to, you know, it's probably going to be as hard as, you know, the life that you're living right now for a certain period of time. It's going to be as uncomfortable and as scary and as horrible, but it, it, it definitely moves in the direction of um, light and happiness and and... And with all that hard work every day, I just learned more things about myself. And I was more strict about the energy I kept around me. And I was, and I was adamant that I wanted a really happy life. And that it wasn't going to always be happy. But I was adamant that I would put as much hard work into it so I was never, would never get to a, the points that I did. But I'm still like learning. Even the other day, you know, I decided to come off medication because I was like, oh, I'm ready to come on medication after five years. And I couldn't do it. And to me, it was like a complete failure. I was like, what? Like, I thought it was all good. I thought I could do this without being on medication. But actually, now, if I look at it with a more positive outlook, how amazing it is that I can look at it and know, okay, maybe not right now. I, I need to take this medication so that I can come here and I can come talk to you and I can, and I can you know, be a good girlfriend, be a good sister and all sorts of things. Maybe I need that right now because my life is really busy. But um, it's not forever. I don't catastrophize like I used to. Before it was like, it's the end of the fucking world. Now it's like, okay, this is just another step, another hurdle I have to get over. Mm and it will get easier, and maybe one day I won't need to take medication. Um, but I still find it, you know, I still find it difficult just the conversation of mental health, because, you know, even though as a family we've all been through this and my parents understand, they still don't, they can't see it, and I find that so difficult. I can't show you what's going on in my head and how anxious I am and that my OCD's gone haywire and that, you know, the anxieties led to me like being like majorly germaphobic, all these sorts of things. I can't explain to you without sounding like a psychopath. But if, if you could only see, if I only had like a broken leg and you could see how I was actually feeling, I still find that really difficult because we don't have enough like people know about it, we talk about it, but still like the language is like I, I would never, I find it still very difficult to put into words to some people, like, how I'm actually feeling. Yeah. Mm. I think that, unfortunately, wraps up our time for the questions. Um, I just want to, before we end the event, say thank you again for oh, coming no, thank here. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you.